very happy to be here in Calcutta. Uh, today, the program is, I hope, uh, remember which button to push, Sound and Light. I, I made this slide so that every, everybody would know that I know where I am. All right. Uh, of course, let's see. I don't remember how to do this. Okay, here we go. First thing, it's important for everybody to understand what the program is about. So, here's, uh, let's see. Uh, tell me when you know what the program is about. <laughs> First, <laughs> disgusting. Of course, if you uh, only see part of the evidence, like part of the sign, half of the sign, you're likely to draw an incorrect conclusion, aren't you? You just did. Yeah. <laughs> so, what we do in our classes at the university, what we do in programs like uh, like this, is to to try to go a little bit more in depth to see how things work, to see uh, some of the details and the physics of uh, various, uh, various topics. Today, what we'll be talking about is sound and light, and the idea is to show how the physical concepts of sound and light are applied to the, uh, to the waves, so we can describe them, and then how our sense of sound and sense of light combined to allow us to, to see and hear these various waves. And we'll expand a little bit about that and do some, uh, I hope, some interesting uh, experiments and, and perhaps interesting extensions of the uh, of, of just purely sound and light. So a lot of light waves that we can't see and a lot of sound waves that we can't hear. So, uh, our first experiment today is going to be the Bell in Vacuum experiment. And that's here. This was made by the people here. Uh, let's see. We've got a bell in the jar here. Can you turn the bell on? Oh, okay. That's simple enough. Down below, is a vacuum pump. Vacuum pump, everybody knows what that means. It pulls the air out of the, uh, out of the jar when we turn it on. Here's a gauge which reads the air pressure in this, uh, oh, that's good, in this uh, jar. Here, the, atmos the uh, pressure inside is about atmospheric pressure. And if it goes over to here, that will mean that the pressure has reduced down to zero on the scale of this uh, of this uh, gauge and this kind of instrumentation. Uh, so uh, here's the question: Everybody know what will happen to the sound when we turn that off? When we when we pull the air out? Anything? Will anything happen to the sound? Well, I have some idea. Oh, here's another question. Will a bell in there, a little blue bell, look different when we pump the air out? No. Okay. Well, they have a, a now a hypothesis, so we can go ahead and pump the air out and see what happens. Just let it go all the way down. What happened? Now the air may leak back in very slowly. And you pull a little plug and let it leak back, uh, not real fast, but a little slowly so that they can hear what happens. Is it gone? No. It comes back. All right. This is an interesting experiment. It's usually taken to as a demonstration of the fact that sound waves cannot pass through a vacuum. <coughs> sound waves, in physics terms, sound waves require a medium in which to propagate. That is some kind of material. It doesn't have to be air. It can be water. 
wood, metal, anything. But sound waves being mechanical waves, mechanical vibrations, require a material or medium in which to propagate from one point to another. And this sort of shows that because when we reduced the pressure of the air and almost removed the air, you couldn't hear the sound anymore. It's not quite that simple. Uh, there's a little bit of a swindle involved there. Thank you, you turn it off now, wonderful. Uh, there's a little bit of a swindle there. And if you're interested in more of, the, uh, of, of how this works and some more history about it, you can read, uh, there's a very good article in the, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, written version from about 1991. I wrote it. And uh, they, we tell a little bit about some of the uh, history of sound starting with, uh, with this experiment. Uh, it was actually done for the first time by, in 1650 by a guy named Athanasius Kircher. And when he did it, he didn't have a very good vacuum pump. And the problem, the issue was, the question that he was trying to decide was, are, is, is a sound wave a wave movement of stuff causing sound to propagate from one point to another, or is it little particles of energy? little bits of energy that are given off by the thing making the sound that are picked up by your ears. Uh, so, if you do this experiment then, uh, you, can, uh, you can tell because if you pump all the air out, it couldn't be a wave because after all sound, like every other wave, has to have a medium. That's what they thought then. Uh, but if, it's, if you remove the air and the air is, isn't the medium then, uh, then if you still hear it, it has to be little particles of energy rather than wave going, uh, carrying the sound. Uh, of course, in 1650, they knew that all waves required a medium. They knew that. For example, light waves required a medium. And the light from things like the sun and the stars going through outer space required a medium. Therefore, they hypothesized the idea of what, what was it called? What's the medium for light in the outer space? The ether. ether, right. They hypothesize something called ether. Of course, nowadays we know that that doesn't exist. But everybody knew that back in 1650. Well, not everybody, but most people accepted that. There's an old Appalachian saying, uh, Appalachian folk saying, the, uh, the people in, uh, in West Virginia and Tennessee, says, uh, it's not what you don't know that hurts you, it's what you know that ain't so. And he, so they knew, they knew that, there, that waves, light waves required a medium, which wasn't so. And they were trying to see whether sound waves were similar. Uh, so Kircher did this experiment in 1650, and his pump wasn't very good. So when he thought he pumped all the air out, there was still a lot of air in there. He heard the bell and then draw, drew the conclusion that sound was little particles of energy incorrect conclusion. About 10 years later, 20 years later, 1670 or so, this experiment was repeated by another physicist, Robert Boyle. Who's heard of Robert Boyle? Anybody? A few. Excellent. Good. Uh, he was the guy who discovered Boyle's Law, named it after himself, or somebody named it after him. He was working with, with air under various pressures, and in order to do this experiment, he invented a new type of pump, vacuum pump, the centrifugal pumps mechanism. In fact, the centrifugal pump mechanism is what we still use in vacuum pumps like this. Interesting idea, invented in 1670, and still <coughs> the, uh, the best kind of a pump that's known to scientists for, for, uh, uh, of a coarse pump like this. Interesting experiment. I think this, uh, this little jar that's sitting on here is called a bell jar because of that experiment. All right. So, by the way, how did the, how did the, the uh, look of this change when we pumped the air out? No change, was it? Because light can pass through a vacuum. It does not require a medium. And therefore, the light waves go right out through the glass and the air and the vacuum just like they do when there's air in there. All right, two observations. 
Light doesn't change by going through a vacuum. Sound is impossible to go through a vacuum because it requires a medium. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Well, uh, so now, now that we, uh, we're gonna get rid of that for a minute, uh, now that we've found out probably the most important idea that distinguishes sound and light, probably the most important idea about light to a physicist, that it can propagate through a vacuum, that's really a unique situation. Now we're gonna go ahead and see if we can discover other ideas about sound and light. We're going to start with a wave that we can make with our slinky spring here. This was also made by the uh, by the people here. Excellent job. It's better than the one that I have at, uh, at home. I have to think about making one this long. If I, oops, tell them I'm busy. Uh, if I take the end of this and move it back and forth, I can create a wave. Everybody see that wave? Yes. See, the reason why you saw it, maybe a little hard to see, uh, looking straight on, is that as the wave moves down, let's see, it looks like this, doesn't it? And then a little while later, it looks like this. A little while later, it looks like this. So the uh, coils of the slinky spring, in making that wave move, are moving back and forth like this, aren't they? The wave is propagating, moving along in that direction, and the coils, individual coils, are moving this way. In physics, we have to have a way to describe that. We call this direction the transverse direction for a wave that was plotted like that. Transverse direction means perpendicular. It could be uh, this way, it could be back, it could be up, it could be down, but we can't reduce up and down waves in, in, uh, in something like this. So. Uh, this is the only kind of a transverse wave we can make. All right, here it goes. Yep, a transverse wave. Now we can pull this over a little bit. Set it right on the edge. Excellent, that's fine. And then pull over our next uh, table of equipment here. slide along. Another way of making a uh, transverse wave, by the way, how many of you know different kinds of transverse waves? What what's other kinds of transverse waves that you may know of? Ladies? Water waves? Water waves move along the surface of the water, but the reason why you see them is the water moves up and down, doesn't it? That's transverse, right? And of course, anybody else got an idea? Light. Light, yeah. Rope wave, how'd you guess? Oh, my God. Uh, see, I need a couple of uh, victim, helpers, helpers, right? Let's see, let's try a couple of the ladies here. Uh, here, how about you guys right down here? You guys want to try? We're good here. Let's see, we'll move this back just a little bit. So we'll we'll do. Uh, oh, that's right. Just push. Just push it back. We're okay here. Yep, that's 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 fine. That's one. Yeah. Come on up. All right. Let's see. What's your name? Yasha. Okay, Yasha. Take the end of this and go back down. What's your name? Ishita. Okay, excellent. I may not remember that. Okay. Diasha? All right. Uh, Diasha and I are going to make a couple of waves here, and we'll get Ishita into the picture. Uh, let's see. Hold it tight there. If I move the end of the rope up and down, I can produce a wave. The reason why you see it, the wave is going from me to Diasha. <laughs> But the, the reason why you see it is that the motion, right, the rope itself, is moving up and down, isn't it? All right? In fact, that is a transverse wave, isn't it? All right? Uh, this, we could further define, this is a, a vertically polarized transverse wave because the rope is moving up and down vertically, 
And even if this were a really long rope, it would still maintain its vertical orientation as it went, uh, moved along the rope. Uh, Biasha, can you send me a horizontally polarized transverse wave? <laughs> if this is vertically polarized, what's horizontally polarized? Yeah, I think so. Horizontal, right? Vertically polarized and horizontally polarized. Yes? Right? Sure. Okay. Is she? She said it. Okay. I'll try. All right. Now, is she, you, get to, you get to operate the uh, wire cooker coolie, cookie coolie. A couple of wire cookie coolies here. Let's see. You may have seen, I don't know whether you use these things in India. I guess you, do, I guess you make cookies. Uh, so, here you go. The shita, all right. Move over that way just a little bit more, right in the center of the stage, all right. Hold them up. Let's see. And she is holding the two cookie coolies now, so that they're uh, hold it right vertically. There you go. Uh, and because the rope is going right through the uh, the cookie coolers, uh, that wave continues to go right through. Doesn't it? It's because they're vertical. Uh, how about if the uh, horizontal wave? Is she too? All right. It stops, doesn't it? Because of the vertical wires. All right, now rotate them. Nope. Rotate them so they're horizontal. Here. Don't. Here we go. All right, this way. Here they're, they're vertical. And now if you rotate it like this, they're horizontal. Excellent. All right. So now, what will my vertical wave do? Stop. Right? How about the horizontal wave? It goes through, doesn't it? Okay, now rotate one so it's horizontal and one vertical. You're getting a lot of help. Right, let's try it here. Ah, there it is. Okay. All right. One. One's horizontal and one's vertical, right? So now what's going to happen? You no. Know? Let's see, if I do a vertical wave, it stops. Do your horizontal wave, it stops. In fact, any wave, vertical, horizontal, at an angle, this way or that way, it'll all stop because of the two wire racks that are crossed. They won't, therefore, let any, any wave go through. All right? Excellent. Thank you, ladies. Good. That's all. You may be seated. Uh, I'll take it. Thanks. Let's see. The reason why we did this experiment is because now we can do this same experiment with light. Uh, untangle this later then. All right. And to do that experiment with light, we're going to use this setup here. I have a light. Uh-oh. Oh, I know we just need to turn it on. Yeah. All right. There it is. This material is called Polaroid, polarizing sheet. It's uh, two pieces of plastic, plastic on either side. And in the middle is a stretched crystal of iodine. Everybody know what iodine is? What's the one? word that describes iodine most fundamentally. Everybody together. Elements. Right, it's an element. One of the elements is iodine. And it can be uh, formed as a liquid, a solid, or a vapor. You take a crystal of iodine, <coughs> right? Oh, don't take that away, leave it here because I'm going to use it in just a minute. That's fine. It's, it's fine, just to say it. Thank you. Uh, Let's see, uh, if you take a crystal of iodine and stretch it, it will stretch and form long lines of iodine atoms lined up parallel to each other, a lot like this wire rack. Okay. Doesn't work exactly the same way, but the net result of that is that light that passes through one of these Polaroids 
will all be polarized or lined up in the same direction, just like a rope wave, right? A rope wave was vertical. In fact, uh, this light is called unpolarized light, it's light that came uh, from this uh, light bulb. Unpolarized means that some of it is vibrating like this as it goes along. Look at the light, think of the light as a little rope wave. Or like this maybe, or like this, or like this. Tiny little rope waves going in all, all different directions of polarization. When I put this piece of Polaroid in, this is lined up now so that all the light passes through it is polarized vertically. Right? All of it's polarized up and down like the little rope waves that I made, we made here, that were polarized up and down. Here's the second piece of Polaroid. If I line this up the same way, put it in front, same situation, and the light comes right through it. See, that's the same as what happened with this, wasn't it? When I had two of these that rotated, that were lined up, and the, the rope wave could go, to, go through them. Oh, uh, let's see. Here's the question for you. I have these lined up, right? The light comes through. What happens if I cross this one, right? So that this one's vertical and this one's horizontal. Would the light get brighter, dimmer, or stay the same? Mm. Maybe we got to vote on it. India is a democracy. Let's see. Uh, we can vote for brighter, dimmer, or stay the same. Who says you think that the light will get brighter when I hold this here and then rotate it so it's horizontal? Who says it's going to get brighter? Raise your hand. Nobody? How about it'll get dimmer? Raise your hand. Good many there. How about stay the same? All right, good many there. So you think it's either going to get dimmer or stay the same. One nice thing about having the apparatus here is we can actually do it. So here they are crossed, or uh, parallel, and now I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees and it's crossed. Rotate it again so it's parallel, and then again so it's crossed. Parallel again, and again crossed. All right, let's see. This experiment demonstrates that light wave is, in fact, a transverse wave. It's like a rope wave. And rope waves are a nice model for a light wave. We can think of certain properties of rope waves. We can visualize it. It's not that everything we do uh, with light can be described by looking at it like a rope wave or thinking about it as a rope wave. But there are a few things that we can look at with light and think of it in terms of the model of a rope wave. And this is one of them. Probably the most important idea about light, the second most important maybe, that it goes through a vacuum, propagates through a vacuum, and that the light waves are transverse waves. So now that we've seen that uh, light waves are transverse waves, we should do a, an experiment or two that involve that transverse property of light and, uh, and require light to be a transverse wave in order for it to work. The first one of these is this material. This is uh, a bottle right off the store, right out of the store in, in, the, in the United States. You guys have caro syrup? Corn syrup. Corn syrup. You may not call it caro syrup, that's a brand name. This is a bottle of corn syrup. You put it between the two Polaroids and then rotate the front Polaroid, this is what happens. Saw the change of color? Yes. Right? Let's see. This is called optical activity. Light waves that come through the first Polaroid are vertically polarized. When they strike the caro syrup, the caro syrup molecule has a really interesting property. I should probably tell you what a molecule of caro syrup looks like. Let's see. When you take 
small molecules of sugar. Sugar has very small molecules, doesn't it? So that it can be easily, uh, easily digested and give you quick energy. Right? Very small molecules do this. But if you take the molecules of sugar and combine them, make them add on to each other to make longer molecules, get some interesting properties. It doesn't just form a line or some random thing going hither and yon. It forms a circle, right? like this. But it doesn't quite form a circle. It forms a circle. When it gets back around, it is not going to the same place. It is advanced, like the thread of a screw. Right? There's a pitch to it. In fact, it advances when you go, I'm doing this now, it advances when you go counterclockwise. That's the opposite from a standard screw, isn't it? It goes like this, right? <coughs> sugar molecules are mostly, like, like this sugar, is, are mostly left-handed. That's what that means, right? So, if you uh, make uh, these sugar molecules into long, chains of molecules like they are in the carob syrup, well, let's see, it would be, uh, the syrup would have various lengths of these things, chunks of it. Sort of like if you cut lengths and little chunks of the, uh, of the slinky spring, <laughs> pulled it out so it wouldn't sprung back, and then cut little lengths of it, threw it into a bucket and shook it. And then when you poured it out, see, they would grab each other, wouldn't they? So it would make it sort of viscous, and that's what this is. The, notice the bubble moves more slowly than if this were some really slippery, uh, uh, very small molecule like water or alcohol, something, that, uh, gasoline. See how slowly that goes? This is rather viscous material, this, this corn syrup. That's one reason, one thing that happens because of the, the shape of the molecule, and the other thing that happens is optical activity. It's a little more complicated. But you can see, you can show that as the, as the light comes through the carob syrup, the fact that these molecules are little chunks of a coil, right, with a pitch, like a, like a helix, uh, makes, the, makes the, uh, the direction of polarization rotate in the same direction, to the left, like this, as I'm, as I'm going this direction. So, all of, the, all of the light goes like this and starts to rotate, okay? but not at the same rate. The red light rotates, green light rotates a little faster, and the blue light rotates a little bit faster yet. That's actually the reason why the sky is blue, but we won't get into that issue. So if I rotate this to the right direction here, uh, what can happen? is that I will remove all the red light by this polarizer. The red light that passes through the carob syrup is all at a certain angle, and I remove it. And that leaves white light minus red. Let's see, white light is what? Red, green, and blue mixed together, isn't it? So if I remove the red, I have green and blue, which is a sort of a cyan color. Is that what this is? Pretty much? The, mid, the middle of it, yep. So I remove the red light. If I move it a little bit, rotate, rotate it a little bit further, I can remove the green light. What color will you see? Blue. Red and blue, which is sort of a magenta color, isn't it? If there's a little more red, it's pink. If there's a little more blue, it's purple. Let's try it here. I remove the green, and there. Is that a sort of a magenta color? And then if I remove, rotate it further, I remove the blue. And what's red or white minus blue? Red and green. Red and green, which combine together make yellow or orange. So let's try it here. Is it? Yes. I think so. So as I rotate it, it goes to cyan, then magenta, and then yellow. Right? So, this, this property of light depends on the fact that light is a transverse wave. Very important. Here's another example of this. Oop, that's enough to trick you. That's a nice, nice, uh, nice video shot, actually. I like that a lot. 
This device is called a pelage. A pelage is a collage of optically active material. Here we have a light box, light, uh, a fluorescent light in the back of it, and then a piece of Polaroid. When I flip the switch, the Polaroid will rotate. If I rotate the Polaroid in back, the same thing happens here as rotating the front Polaroid. Does it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. This collage, a collage of optically active materials. Everybody know what is a collage, right? A collage, right? So this is a collage of optically active materials, mostly plastics on the back here. Uh, some of it is colored plastic and some of it is plastic, which obtains its color because of the optical activity. Finally, on the front is, a, uh, is another Polaroid, polarizing sheet. Put this on and then make the collage rotate. Is it moving? As it rotates, it then morphs from the little worm here to the cocoon to the butterfly. These collages were named, collages were named and uh, developed by an artist by the name of Austin Wood Camero in the United States. Uh, she's made these things for something like 30 years and still making them. She has a really nice website. In fact, uh, if you go to our uh, website and, uh, and find the Pelage, P-O-L-A-G-E, on that website, Actually, there's a little search engine right on the front page of our website, I'll show you. You can type P-O-L-A-G-E and it'll go to uh, the, the description of this experiment and then you can see, uh, you can see uh, a link to, uh, to the artist who makes these things. Really an interesting thing. I like this a lot because it has elements of artistic value in it. It's a pretty neat picture, isn't it? And she uses, uses ideas in physics, in optics, uh, optical activity, to achieve a really neat artistic end result. All right. Let's see, let me... We can push this back. In the meantime, let's see, I'll, I will... Uh, this is optical activity using white light. And if I go to down here, here's our web page on, on the collage. And here, here are a couple of the collages that we have. This is the butterfly uh, one. It's actually called Swallowtail. That's the name of that particular collage because it's a swallowtail butterfly. And here's another one. It's a little more abstract. I like the butterfly better because I, I can recognize the things in it rather than uh, just an abstraction. Anyway, so this is the, uh, the idea of the collage and where you can find out more information about it. Let's see, I think, whoops, no, that's not it. Uh, what do we want to go to this one? Yep, there it is. All right. So now, what we're going to do is to go back to our slinky spring. Like, 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 I can just uh, leave it just like this. Okay, yeah, flip on it. That's, that's fine. We'll leave it just like this. Just like on this. All right, excellent. If I take the slinky spring now, and rather than move it back and forth to create a transverse wave, I can squish the thing and create a longitudinal wave. Let's see. Here, here it is. Can everybody see that wave move along? It. See that? It's a squished region. That is to say, here goes, uh, I, I move my hand back and forth like this, so it squeezes the coils together. A little while later, it looks like this, doesn't it? A little while later, it looks like this. Let's see. So the motion that creates that wave, as, we're, as the wave propagates along the slinky spring, from this end down to the other end, the motion of the coils is along the same direction that the wave is propagating, isn't it? 
That's the longitudinal direction. This is the transverse direction, any direction perpendicular, and this is the longitudinal direction. In fact, a real full trans a longitudinal wave consists of a compression, meaning that the coils are compressed together, followed by a rarefaction, which means they're spread apart. If I hold the end here and move it back and forth, when I move it away, I'm compressing the, the coils. When I move it back, I'm spreading them apart. So I can create a longitudinal wave with a series of compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay. And that's pretty much what a longitudinal wave looks like. A little more complicated than that when you get right down to it. But the reason why we do this is that it turns out that a longitudinal wave is the type of wave that a, uh, that a sound wave is. And we can use now, rather than a rope wave as a model for light, we can use this kind of a, of a longitudinal wave in a slinky spring as a model for a sound wave. Where the, the modeling is that the, the coils of the slinky spring are, uh, represent layers of air. Sort of a funny thing because you can't have layers of air pulling on each other really. But uh, we can think of the layers of air pushing and pulling on each other to make the, uh, the rarefactions and compressions move along like that through the air. This is a very nice uh, slinky spring. All right, so let's put this down. I'm through with this now. If you want to take it away, that's fine with me. All right, so now, oops, yeah, just put it right down there, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. What we're going to do is an experiment with sound, which we can use uh, sort of to, to develop the whole idea of, of the, this modeling. Uh, excellent. All right, here we go. Uh, most of the ideas in sound, the physics understanding of sound that people had, were, were developed back in the uh, mid-1880s, over 150 years ago, or about 150 years ago. And they didn't have all of the electronic gizmos and doodads that we have here uh, to, to do their scientific investigation. So rather than using electronics or uh, peculiar, uh, unusual things, they had to do it with simple, more simpler techniques. And one of those very simple techniques was a candle. Uh oh. I left my matches back here, something. Uh, yeah, a little package of matches. Oh, here it is. Excellent. All right. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, in the mid 1800s, 150 years ago or so, there were probably at least a dozen different physics researchers in the area of sound who, uh, who in fact wrote books, whole books, about how to use flames, like the candle flame, to, to investigate how a, uh, how a sound wave works. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a rather, rather simple version of that. Let's see. If I turn on a candle, or turn on the, the sound here, we'll do that in a minute. Here's our candle flame. When I turn on the sound, if the sound makes the, uh, makes the air move, then it ought to blow the candle flame, shouldn't it? So what we're going to do now is try to see how the candle flame is blown by, a, uh, by the sound wave coming out of this loudspeaker. In particular, we want to see whether the candle flame is blown back and forth like this or back and forth like this. What will that tell us? Longitudinal or transverse wave, isn't it? If the flame is blown, if I start a, can, a, a wave here with our loudspeaker, and it's a transverse wave, the candle flame in the air will blow back and forth like this. If it's longitudinal, it'll blow back and forth like this one. 
Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's turn it on here and see if we can. Uh, let's see. You can start to see the candle flame flicker a little bit. Incidentally, you'll see the straight on view. You can see that looking this way. And the camera here is looking uh, on the screen over there, is looking crosswise. So any motion that he sees now is going to be longitudinal. This motion you'd be able to see out in the in the chairs would be transverse, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, let me find the right frequency. I'll go faster here. And now all you'll see is a blur. Which way is it moving? Longitudinally. I can uh, rotate the speaker on the Lazy Susan here. All right, you can see the candle flame blowing, what, a couple of centimeters, isn't it? Back and forth, longitudinally. Can everybody see that? Yes, sir. All right, excellent. Let's put it back. Uh, when I move it around, it uh, creates aircrafts up here. There we go. So it's moving longitudinally, isn't it? Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clearly. All right, so this experiment is taken as evidence that sound waves are longitudinal waves. That is, sound waves cause vibrations in the air which are longitudinal. Let's see. When the loudspeaker pushes the air this way, it creates a compression. Just like I created a compression in the, in the slinky coils. When the loudspeaker cone pulls back, it's a rarefaction. Compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction. And that makes the air move enough to cause the candle flame to move a couple of centimeters. That's a pretty big, a pretty big effect, isn't it? All right, interesting idea. Okay, we're done with this one. We can roll this back out of the way. <coughs> Incidentally, uh, just for the fun of it, I, I did uh, put links on all, all of these, and we can go, I can find the mouse, there we go. We can go to this uh, experiment on our website as an example to you, and uh, here are a couple of interesting, nice uh, videos. If I click on this one, you can see a video that we've made of the candle flame as the speaker is rotated on the little uh, Lazy Susan. It's a pretty long video, so it's taking a little while to, to uh, download. That's all right, though. Here it is. Now we're looking crosswise at it. And as the speaker is rotated, now the speaker is behind. We're looking straight along it. And you can see that the candle flame is moving longitudinally. Here now, as it rotates once again, we're going to look crosswise. And there you see the motion of the candle flame as being clearly, clearly longitudinal. All right. It is clear, isn't it? Maybe. Let's see. All right. So what we've seen is that light waves are transverse waves that do not require a medium, and sound waves are longitudinal waves which do require a medium. Yes? Another interesting observation is that the flame is moving inwards. Inward? No, to and fro. No, the flame is, flame is totally shifted inward. No, no, no. Towards the speaker, inside the speaker. It, it moves back and forth. Well, so, but as a whole, the flame uh, uh, shifted the top of the flame, 
seated inside the speaker, and that's happened due to Bernoulli's theorem. Oh, you mean sometimes it moves in and sometimes out? No, no, no. no, no. Always it is shifted inward, uh, inside the speaker. I, I can't. You can't. No, no. They say the they observe that the plane pointing towards the pointing speaker. Pointing towards the speaker rather than away from it. Yeah. Actually, I think whether it points towards or away uh, is random. It, uh, sometimes when we do the experiment, it goes out. Sometimes it goes in. It's just how it started, and I don't know how I don't know how that happened. But I I think that's a secondary effect. The most important idea is that it's actually is moving a lot longitudinally. The teeth pointed inwards. That is due to Bernoulli's theorem because as the yeah, drum is as the speaker is vibrating, as the speaker is vibrating the inner portion, there is a greater movement of the ear, lowering the pressure. Yeah, maybe we should talk about it later. Okay. All right. Back to the point here. So, uh, light waves we've seen are transverse waves that are rope models, and there are waves, electromagnetic waves, that require no medium. Sound waves are longitudinal waves, and they do require a medium. Uh, yes, okay, so now what we want to do is a little more investigation of sound. And to do that, we're going to get our loudspeaker system out, I hope. Uh, yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, well, actually, we want to leave this close here and we'll pull it out. Oh, which one's got the uh, long cord? That, that one's the long cord? Okay, that'll work. That's the long cord to this one. Okay, that's fine. Okay, we got two loudspeakers here. And the first thing we're going to do is a hearing test. Uh, let's uh, turn the uh, sound on, I hope. That's on, we're ready to go. Uh, okay. Just, uh, the, uh, oh, that's not on. Okay, now we're good. Okay, here we go. All right. I made a sound with the loudspeakers here. Uh, everybody can hear that? So, uh, here's the question. A sound wave is a vibration. How many times per second is this vibrating? Like, is it closer to 50 times a second? Or maybe 500 times a second? Or maybe 5,000 times a second? Or maybe 50,000 times a second? How fast do you think it's vibrating? 200. Well, maybe we won't vote. Let's see, the way I set this, the vibration is about 500 times a second, right? That's what a 500 freak oscillation, 500 hertz oscillation sounds like. Hertz is the unit of, uh, of vibration, unit of frequency, uh, named after Heinrich Hertz, uh, who investigated a lot of radio wave uh, issues back, uh, discovered radio waves back in the, uh, in the 1800s. So, uh, this is a 500 hertz tone. Let's see. Uh, I can't see quite see what that, that is. That's right. Uh, let's go down in frequency. If I go to 400 hertz, how will that change the sound? Will it change the sound? No. Well, let's do it. 500, 400. Did it change? Lower, like a lower note on an instrument, isn't it? 300, 200. That's down, that's 100 hertz. Uh, down near the bottom of the bass clef in the, uh, in the music notation, you can't see it down there. 
Uh, down near the bottom of a bass singer singing range. That's me. I'm a bass singer. Uh, can you hear lower than that? Sure. Let's try it. Here's uh, 80 hertz. Everybody hear it? Yes. Turn it up a little bit. That's 60 hertz. Everybody hear it? Yes. Sort of. 40 hertz. Yes, yes, That's yes, hard yes. to hear, isn't it? You might hear something. Let's see, these are pretty good speakers, actually. But even these speakers don't go quite down to uh, 40 hertz real well. Uh, in fact, uh, the only way you can really get 40 hertz so you can hear it nicely is probably in one of these uh, really high quality earphones. Uh, uh, can you hear lower than that? Well, yeah, you can hear down. If you did that experiment very carefully without any noise and with really high quality earphones, you'd probably be able to hear down to about 20 hertz. So 20 hertz is what we call the lowest frequency for human hearing. You think there are sound waves or waves like sound below 20 hertz? Of course, absolutely there are. And what's it called? Everybody together. What's it? Infrasound. I-N-F-R-A sound. Let's try it. Now how successful this is going to be? Maybe I can rotate this a little bit and keep it in front of the back of the speaker. Ah, there we go. That's, that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of interesting examples. Oh, yeah, turn the lights down just a little bit. A lot of interesting examples of infrasound, uh, infrasonic effects. Uh, one is earthquakes. Earthquakes are infrasonic vibrations, about 12 to 15 hertz, typically. That's below the, the range we can hear, so we can't hear earthquakes, but we can hear the effects of earthquakes sometimes. Uh, let's see. Uh, storms, like thunderstorms, also have a lot of infrasound in them, a lot of low frequency sound. Sort of interesting. Uh, very low frequencies of sound and infrasound tend to bend and spread out much more readily than higher frequencies. So low frequencies, if you have a large amount of low frequency, like a, in a storm, a thunderstorm, when it goes pow, has a lot of very low frequencies, and they'll tend to, to follow the surface of the earth. And uh, if you can hear it, you can hear thunderstorms coming from around the surface of the earth long time before you can actually see the thunder and see the lightning or see the thunder and uh, see, the, see the lightning that's causing the thunder uh, in fact uh, cattle are sensitive to lower frequencies than we humans uh, so uh, cattle can often tell you that there are thunderstorms and uh, bad storms coming from be before you can actually see the clouds and notice that they're there in as a person. That's why uh, when storms are coming, you sometimes see groups of cattle that sort of bunch together to protect themselves. Anybody notice that? In, in a storm, when a storm comes, that often happens. Uh, also, the tsunami. Storms like that, uh, big, e big events, earthquakes and tsunamis, have a lot of infrasound. And big animals like cattle and elephants are very sensitive to lower frequencies than humans are. Uh, so, uh, in the, when the tsunami occurred, remember there were a lot of elephants that were tied to, to big uh, a chain, to big concrete posts, and sometime, they, all of a sudden, they just decided that they, they had heard the tsunami coming, and they were frightened, so they broke their tethers and walked up the mountain. Remember hearing stories about that, and the people who were sitting on them were frightened. Very scared because they didn't know why the, why the elephants had broken their tethers and were walking up the mountain. But then, when the mount, well, elephants got up the mountain safe, they turned around and looked and saw the damage due to the tsunami, and they were very happy that the elephants could actually hurt, hear that, uh, that those waves, those infrasonic waves ahead of time. So anyway, that's uh, an interesting thing about uh, an interesting result from. from 
uh, elephants and other large animals being sensitive to, to infrasound. How many of you are, uh, suffer from some kind of motion sickness? Group, any of you? Raise your hand. Not very many. Hmm. Well, uh, often in a group like this, when I give talks to students in the States, uh, they, uh, there would be a, a couple of dozen who can sense that that vibration is there. And a lot of, uh, of physiologists and people who study these sort of things believe that uh, hypersensitivity to infrasound is largely or at least partially responsible for motion sickness. Okay. Interesting idea. A lot of ornithologists believe that bird migration has something to do with infrasound. Has anybody ever heard of Schumann resonances? Of course not. Why would you? When lightning goes off, it creates electromagnetic waves, and they form standing waves around the Earth at very low frequencies. And a lot of people believe that there are infrasonic standing waves that occur due to all kinds of noises that occur on the, on the surface of the Earth. And these standing waves uh, are sort of a, a location uh, system for birds. They can tell where they're going by sensing the, the ultrasonic waves at various places on the Earth. And there are a lot of ornithologists who believe that, that this sensitivity of birds, presumed sensitivity of birds to, to infrasound, is, uh, helps them in, in their migration. All right, well, let's see, let's go the other direction. We'll start here at, uh, this is set to uh, 40 hertz, I believe, which nobody can hear. 60, 80. Hear it again? Here's 100. 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900. There's a thousand hertz. Everybody hear that? I hope so. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to go back one on this. Uh, go back one. A thousand hertz is up near the top of the, uh, just above the treble clef in Western music. Here's 100 hertz. Here's a thousand. And that's near the top of a soprano singer's singing range. So humans sing between about 100 hertz and about 1,000 hertz. Uh, of course, we can hear a lot higher than that. So that's our next experiment. In fact, uh, well, I'm going to turn this down a little bit while I tell you about this next range. We're going to go from 1,000 hertz to 10,000 hertz. <coughs> and the arrangement here, the little oscillator and the amplifier and the speakers, will, will produce waves which are about the same loudness, or getting just a little bit louder as, as I go from 1,000 hertz to 10,000 10, hertz. Let's see. But your ear won't hear it that way. Your ear doesn't hear the same at all frequencies. You don't hear very well at all around 30 or 20 hertz. You don't hear very well at all if you go up to very high frequencies. But in the mean, in the middle, you hear better. In fact, your hearing is probably the best around 3,000 to 5,000 hertz. So, what I'm going to ask you to do, we're going to go from 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, up to 10,000 hertz, listen to it, and Take note as to where you think it sounds the loudest. And then we'll go back and vote. Well, you raise your hand where you heard the sound as being loudest. Now, as I go up there, you'll hear it get loud and then you'll hear it get softer. It'll still be annoying, but it'll get softer. So let's try that. <coughs> All right. Here's a thousand hertz. Uh, here's two thousand. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, and 10,000 hertz. All right, you ready? <coughs> You're going to vote for the loudest. 1,000 hertz, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. 5,000, 
6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, and 10,000. So it was four, three, four, and 5,000 hertz, wasn't it? The maximum is about 4,000 hertz. In fact, the, the most sensitive frequency for your ears is about 4,000 hertz. And that's what you just discovered, isn't it? Right? Neat. Nice experiment. But you can hear higher than that, can't you? All right, so let's go higher. Okay, I'm going to go down here to, uh, and then switch it to 10,000 hertz. Who hears that? Raise your hand if you hear it. And as I go up in frequency, I'll tell you what frequency it is, and keep your hands up, and then lower them when you don't hear it anymore. All right. All right, 10,000. Here's 12,000. Everybody still hears it? Good. 14,000. Everybody hear Good. 16,000. 17,000. I'll turn up a little bit. 18,000. 19,000. 20,000. 21,000. Who hears it? Raise your hand. Nobody? That's good because I unplugged it. <laughs> All right, excellent. Let's see. Usually when I do this for a class of 25 or 30 students, there are one or two who are still hearing it. <laughs> Actually, if you do hear frequencies high frequencies like that, it's, called, it's, a, it's a problem in your ear called tinnitus. Ringing in the ear. And probably if you do hear that, you should tell your parents or your doctor uh, because there are uh, damage to the ear, and you can also uh, obtain or hear high frequencies when you're, uh, when the audio nerve between your ear and the brain is squished, something like like with a with a tumor. So there are things that you can do sometimes to fix that. Sometimes you can't if it's damaged to the inner ear. Anyway. So, uh, what we've discovered is our ears can hear from 20 hertz or so on the low side up to about 20,000 hertz on the high side. You see, there are low frequencies called infrasound that are too low for us to hear. Is there anything too high for us to hear? Everybody together, what is it? Ultrasound, absolutely. Well, let's go to our ultrasound department. Here it is. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but in the in the states, a lot of uh, a lot of people have dogs as pets, and in uh, training the dogs, they use little tiny dog whistles that produce a frequency of about 23 or 24,000 hertz. Dogs can hear up to about 40,000 hertz, very high frequency, much higher than humans. So when you blow your dog whistle, the dog hears it real well, but you don't because it's in ultrasound to us. Uh, it's an idea. You can train your dog to respond to these things even though nobody else hears it. Uh, how many of you, see in the other programs, nobody had done it, how many of you have had uh, uh, teeth uh, filled, cavities filled in your teeth? You? Let's see. How many of you have had cavities filled in your teeth where they don't use any Novocaine to deaden your tooth first? I know everybody's grimacing up here. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, you can use what's called ultrasonic drilling, sort of like sandblasting, you know, where they take sand and blast the, uh, the capital dome and clean it off. Anybody heard of that? No, okay. Uh, you, can, you can use a, an ultrasonic vibration as, as a drill. It doesn't create the heat, so you don't have to have Novocaine to deaden the, the uh, feeling in your, in your teeth, in your mouth. And that's really a pretty a neat thing, uh, because that means that, uh, uh, well, there are a certain number of people who are going to be allergic to things like Novocaine or even uh, nitrous oxide, laughing gas, that you use for, for, as a same th for the same thing. And if you're allergic to that, a certain number of them will actually get sick or die. So by using ultrasonic drilling for your teeth you can, and for cleaning, 
the vibrations thing that, that cleans your teeth. Uh, you can actually uh, prevent people from reacting to, to this uh, medication and dying. Very, uh, it would be in the, in the thousands of years probably, uh, of people per year. It may even be in a bigger country like India, millions per year, if everybody was getting this kind of uh, dental treatment. All right, ultrasonic microscope. That's a really neat thing. You can use very high frequency ultrasound as a microscope, just like, well, just like uh, a, an optical microscope. Only it works better because you can put it on the end of a really thin, thin tube or wire and stick it into a blood vessel and look at things like uh, cholesterol in the blood, in the vessel, while it's there, while it's alive. And that's, uh, that's a really neat new technique for, uh, for a medicine uh, that allows you to, a doctor, to, to see whether that uh, cholesterol in your blood vessel is going to be dangerous and kill you. Another thing, let's uh, see, I think uh, in India they're starting to have more colon cancer, aren't they? Uh, as time goes on, as the, as the uh, length of life for people gets longer, they get more colon cancer. And in the process of examining the colon, they can use ultrasonic microscopes to look at things like the uh, polyps in the colon to see whether or not they have, uh, they have cancerous tissues in them. Much easier to see using that because you're looking at it live tissue rather than uh, tissue that you have to kill before you can look at it. Well, finally, we have the idea of a sonogram. Okay, ladies. Uh, how many of you have seen your sonogram? How many of you know what your sonogram is? Okay, sonogram, your sonogram would be a picture of you in your mother's womb before you were born. And it's done, it's done using ultrasound. Ultrasound. We're going to look at a sonogram. <coughs> This sonogram will have two parts. It was taken, both of these parts were taken at the, at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. And I got them from a medical physicist, a radiation physicist, who is uh, on the staff of the hospital. I always have a radiation physicist on, in, involved. And this, ho this will, first of all, show the heart of an adult male. And start that. Started here. I can find my mouse. Yeah, there it is. Here's the heart. You can turn the lights down just a little bit more. Good. Turn it down just a little bit more. Here you can see the uh, atrium and ventricle of the heart. Here's the valve. You can see the valve opening and closing, pushing the, the blood from the atri atrium to the ventricle, and then through through the. Uh, uh, my, mitral valve here, and then through the aortic valve into the uh, into the aorta. Here it goes again. See the see the valve moving. This is all done with about uh, three megahertz, three million hertz ultrasound, much higher in frequency than we can hear. Here's an interesting thing. Let me stop this for just a second. Again. Uh, all right, I've stopped it. What we are seeing here is a picture of the blood flow. You can only do this with ultrasound. The ultrasound reflects off the various linings, muscular linings in the, in the heart, and it can also reflect off the blood flowing from the atrium to the ventricle and then down the aorta. When it's flowing, upward towards the, towards the ultrasound setup right here, towards the, the source, it will look red. Now, the, red, the blood should flow up this way through the valve here and then through this valve. Right now, this part of the heart is squeezing, pushing the air, pushing the blood up the aorta. But this valve should be closed, so there should be no blood flow here. Instead, what's happening is that the blood is flowing backwards through the, uh, through the valve. And that's why it's blue or green rather than red. That means that either the valve has a hole in it, 
so the blood can flow through it, or the valve is leaky. The valve doesn't seat well on the, uh, on the uh, corners, on the edge of the, of the hole that the blood flows through. So this, this heart of the adult male shows a, a very serious damage, a serious problem, that the blood flows backwards. Right? And that's what this thing is designed to show, an ultrasonic exam like this. Let's start it once again. Backwards flow through the mitral valve is called mitral regurgitation. Backwards flow through the aortal valve is called aortic regurgitation. And there you can see the blood flow quickly down to the aorta and then leak back. So it's a very, a very important thing for, uh, for doctors to be able to know that, this, this, this valve, that the heart valves are seriously problematic, serious problems with them. And, uh, and they probably need to do something to help this man uh, or, or he'll, be, uh, he'll die. Here's another way that you can uh, tell whether there's, there's uh, some kind of uh, regurgitation happening. What they're gonna do now is to convert the sound, the, the flow of blood into a sound artificially. And when they do that, I hope, uh, I think it's going to come out of sound here. Oh, maybe the sound's not connected. Okay, we don't hear it. That's all right. You can hear the squishing sound. Here's the sound wave. And doctors can, can, uh, can recognize that. And by doing that, can, we'll also know that the, the heart was defective. Okay, now we'll get into... Oh, one more view of the heart, I believe. There it is. Here's the ventricle, two ventricles, and the two atriums. And it shows the, the motion of the valves. Now we're going to see the baby in the womb. Okay, here he is. Here's the head, the body over here, and if you look carefully, you can see in here, you can see the heartbeat. Everybody see that? So here are the uh, parts, here's the eye socket, the head, the heart beating right in here, and the body. Here's the placenta from the baby, and uh, now what they're going to do, what the, what the operator of the ultrasound device is going to do, is to zoom in on the heart. So the heart gets bigger and bigger, and you can watch more carefully the, uh, the motion of the heart. Heart of a baby this size is much smaller, of course. There it is, can you see it? The heart of a baby this size is much smaller than the heart of an adult male, so you can't see as much detail. Now, after doing this, they're gonna look at the blood flow the same way they did for the adult male, and it will be changed to different colors. There it is. You can see that the blood is flowing towards the source, and there's no backflow, no green and blue in that, is there? This means that that baby's heart is very normal, and that the heart is growing well and should, uh, should continue to be well when the baby is born. So it's very important. Uh, to know, be, to be certain that the baby has a good heart, and this is one excellent way that it can be done. All right, that's the end of our video. So, what we've looked at here is what I call, not a formal notation, but I call the sonic spectrum. The sonic spectrum, all these waves that, we're, that we just talked about are longitudinal waves that require a medium and they can be modeled by something like the slinky spring longitudinal waves. Sound below 20 hertz, uh, infrasound below 20 hertz, sound above 20 hertz, up to 20,000 hertz here, 20 to 20,000 hertz, and ultrasound above 20,000 hertz. Here's an interesting idea. There's a maximum frequency that you can have for a sound wave or ultrasound wave. 
when you, sound waves are mechanical vibrations. If you have layers of molecules, one layer moves, it hits the next one, which moves and then hits the next one and so forth. Well, if you have a really high frequency, you'll, you'll push this layer up to this next layer, but by the time the, the, this layer starts to move, you've already turned around and pulling it the opposite direction. And it goes, the wave is pushing and pulling this layer so fast that it doesn't have time to move. That point is called crater sound, about 10 to the 13th hertz. That's really high frequency, isn't it? 10 to the 13th hertz is called crater sound. Interesting idea. All right, well, now what we're going to do is just a couple of, oops, oh, I didn't change this. Well, what we're going to do is a couple of experiments that have to do, we can turn the lights on a little bit more now, that have to do with, oops, with sound waves and the idea, here, just leave it right, right uh, over here. Yep. Okay, here we go. All right, really good loudspeakers. I like these a lot. And I'm going to turn on a sound about uh, about 80 hertz. There's an 80 hertz sound. Now, both of these loudspeakers are working, and they're working together in phase, meaning that their loudspeaker cones are moving like this together, okay? both producing compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, which goes <coughs> to your ears. Now what I'm going to do is flip a switch over here, and that will reverse one of them with respect to the other one. So one of them will be going like this, and the other one will be like this, back and forth. So when this one's producing a compression, this one's producing a rarefaction, and vice versa. What do you think is going to happen? Well, the two speakers are very close to each other, so the sound comes from both at the same time to you. And if this, one of the sounds is a compression, and the other is an equal and opposite rarefaction, they will just cancel each other, won't they? Well, let's see. We can do it with this. Here's a box which will reverse the one with respect to the other. Let's see. Can you hear it? Go up to 100 hertz. Normal, reverse. Almost reversed. Suppose I take this loudspeaker and, and slide it over to the other side. Oops. Yeah, I think, let me try something. Pretty good. All right. So what's going to happen when I move this one? Listen carefully. Okay. Did the sound come back? Yes. Because when I move it over here, compared to this one, they're no longer exactly opposite to your ears because of the space. Interesting idea. It has to do with with how waves mix. If you have a stereo system, you want to make sure that your two loudspeakers are in phase, otherwise you won't hear any bass frequencies from near the center. Let's see if, what happens when we push them back together. Hmm. Well, something. There they are, in phase and out of phase. There we are, in phase and out of phase. I have another little experiment that has to do with the same idea. And I think, uh, here we go. Let's see, let's, uh, oh yes, plug it in, I'll put this 
Uh, I'll put this on here. Ah, excellent. Yep. Uh, oops. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Here's my favorite audio system. I can untangle the wires here. Yeah, we got it. We're good. Let's see. Can't spread it out. Oh, here it goes. Okay, now we're good. As I say, this is my uh, my favorite audio system. I hope some of you guys will like it. Let's see, if we can play a little bit of uh, country music on this. Oh, that's actually a German polka. There it is. You like that audio system? Well, not really. <laughs> I think some of you are wondering why, I, why, why is this my favorite audio system? Of course, most loudspeakers, like these really nice loudspeakers, are not just set up like this, are they? What's the difference? Well, it's bigger. What else? In a box, isn't it? Good reason for that. Because a loudspeaker like this actually produces two sounds. You can see, you can see the speaker cone here, can you? Can you see the bases where the speaker cone sticks out here from the frame, the little black things in it? So when the loudspeaker moves back and forth like this, when it goes this way, it produces a compression over here, doesn't it? When it goes this way, it produces a rarefaction over here, doesn't it? If the speaker cone goes this way, it produces a, what, a rarefaction over here and a compression over here. And those two are equal, exactly opposite each other, aren't they? Interesting thing happens. Those sounds don't just go out like this, they're like this. Because of the idea that it's called diffraction. All light sound waves even light waves to a lesser extent, spread out as they move. So the sound coming out of the front of this, as soon as it comes out, immediately spreads out over the whole space here, going in all directions. The sound from the back spreads out and goes in all directions. And what happens when they, when they go out then? Well, they're opposite, so they cancel each other, don't they? That's what you hear. That's why you don't hear anything very loud when I do this. But if I could stop one of these sounds, the front or the back, from reaching your ear, then it would be louder, wouldn't it? That's a strange idea. Stop part of the sound coming from the loudspeaker and it gets louder. We can do that with this box. Well, it's not a box, but it's one-sixth of a box. Like, with a little hole in it that the speaker can go into. Let's try it. <laughs> so by preventing the sound from the back from reaching your ear directly, what it does is to stop the competing, the canceling wave and make it louder. Here's another interesting idea. In order to do that, you have to have about the same signal coming from the front and the back of the speaker, don't you? You can hold it in front, just what will happen? Well, I'm going to do that. Front side, front, front side, front side. Front side, not that side. Back side. Not, ah. Anything that can prevent some of the sounds from the back from reaching your ear directly from the speaker. Worked, didn't it? Interesting idea. That's one reason, in addition to the fact that these look better with nice cases on them than they would if they were just bare speakers. But it looks better. 
but it also works better because the sound doesn't mix and therefore it doesn't, uh, doesn't cancel. These are two very important ideas about sound. Interference of two waves and diffraction, where the wave spreads out and uh, in all directions from the source, rather than just going in a line, like a laser light, right? My laser, my laser pointer starts here, and the way the, the light from a laser, light in general, doesn't diffract as much, so it's pretty much small, about the same size as this, even when it gets to the screen there, or even when it gets to the back, on the wall back there, it's still not much bigger. Light waves don't diffract as much, don't spread out as much as sound waves. All right, this is a nice example of that. Okay, so we're all done with this. Now I think what we want to do is to go back and do another experiment in light. Let me, uh, let's see, I think this should be the, the demonstration from our, from, from my office lab, and what we're going to do now is to take a light source here, we've got the same light source, I brought it along, here it is, and a slit, and then the light goes into a prism. A prism, a triangular shaped piece of glass. Everybody knows what happens when you pass light through a prism. It separates the light out, separates the light out into its complement colors. Let's see, sometimes that's called the, the rainbow colors because that's the colors of rainbows, these colors. A better name for this effect for all these colors is what's called spectral colors because it turns out that each one of those colors is a different frequency of light. Each one is a different frequency of light. So what we're now going to see, there's a spectrum, let's see I can move it over a little bit, there we go, can everybody see the spectrum over there? Well some of you can. Right? Here's the spectrum of white light. How does it coming out on this? Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, right here, that's nice. Here's our spectrum. It goes from red to orange to yellow to green to cyan to blue and deep violet. And the only difference between those colors is their frequency or wavelength. Red is the lowest frequency. And as you go from red to the orange to the green to the blue, the frequency of the light gets higher. Just like the sounds that we heard. We heard low frequencies of sound and very high frequencies of sound. The entire range of human hearing. This is the entire range of frequencies that people can see. These are the only colors, the only light that we can see are these colors of light. Interesting idea. Now what I'm going to do is to uh, focus this a little closer here. Should be about here now. There it is. Better? Can you see it on this? Let's see. Uh, yeah, right about here. Let me rotate this around just a little bit more. Be okay with the cord there? All right, there it is. There's our, uh, there's our, oops, let's see, if I go back out, okay, there, that's better right there. Although I don't know what, maybe get it, should probably get it out of the, uh, let's do the, push the whole thing that way a little bit. So it's not in the, uh, yeah, okay, that's better, okay, that's better, that's not, oops, I get out of the uh, video projector, yeah, there, okay, yeah, excellent, that's it. All right, can everybody see the entire spectrum there? Yes. If I rotate this a little bit, you can see the whole thing. Okay, we got red, uh, red and green and blue, and the orange and yellow between the green and red and the 
cyan between blue and green. Let's see, is that stuff that's at a higher frequency than blue? Well, yes. This yellow screen, can you see that? Yes. Yellow screen is a fluorescent material which is sensitive to things that are bluer than we can see. That's all this stuff over here. Can you see that? The blue stops around in this region, but the ultraviolet, stuff that's too high in frequency for blue, goes even further. Ultraviolet. You've heard that term, haven't you? Ultraviolet radio. Where does it come from? Sun. Sun. Absolutely. All right. Well, is there stuff that's too low in frequency for you to see? Too red? I think so. That's called what? Infrared, isn't it? This, uh... Oh, there it is. This device, you can hear a sound. So let's move over just a little bit. Okay? Now, we're listening. You can hear a tone. And that tone will rise. Let's see, you can see what I'm looking at here. On the on the little probe, this is a this is an ult, uh, an infrared device, and I'm now in the red. If I go to the off to the side to the infrared, the tone rises, showing that there's more stuff there that we can't see. Now I'll go back to the red. There's red. And infrared. And back to back to uh, red. Okay, I think this a uh, lot of a uh, lot of heat going on here. Actually, uh, put the lights on for a minute. <laughs> this probe, this probe measures infrared radiation. Anybody know what infrared radiation is? actually heat. If it would work right, uh, oops. And I think it's confused by all of the uh, stuff around it. Uh, infrared radiation is heat. That's right. Flip it off. That's right. That, uh, that's got, uh, it's very sensitive. Uh, infrared radiation, uh, let's see, you know the three ways that heat is transferred from one point to another? I think you're answering it. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay. Conduction and convection, you know what they are. Radiation means infrared radiation. It's stuff that's too warm, or that's too red for you to see, but you can feel it as heat. Interesting idea. That if you just change the frequency of light, it feels warm to you. Strange. You know what else? What, what else do you do with infrared radiation? Right, the little TV duhas that you push to change channel. That's all infrared. All those, all those remote controls is infrared radiation. Strange, isn't it? All right. Well, let's see. Let me turn this off. Okay. So, what we've seen is the white light spectrum. Right, red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and deep violet. And we've noticed that there's stuff infrared on the low red side, low frequency side, and ultraviolet on the high frequency side. Um, and here they are. This is the electromagnetic radiation that we have sort of experienced, or measured here. Infrared, light, and ultraviolet. But of course there's more than that. This is the way the physics, the physicist views the electromagnetic spectrum. That is to say, all the different kinds of electromagnetic rays, waves, of which light is a very, very teeny part. Very, very teeny. Here they are, AM radio, low frequency radio, FM and TV, radar, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays, all of those have one very important thing in common, 
and that is that they are just like light. They move through the through uh, move through space at the speed of light, and they have all the different properties the same as light does, except that there are differences in their properties because they are at different frequencies. They're very very important things. Uh, let's see, and one other thing. Light is a really interesting thing. You can think of it as a wave moving along, and you can also think of it as particles. We haven't thought of it like that before. And if you do think of it as particles, those particles have energy. And this is the energy of particles of different types of radio, or different types of electromagnetic waves. Notice that radio waves have really tiny energy of particles, and gamma rays have really large. Visible light has one electron volt. That unit doesn't mean anything to you, but that's all right. Uh, one electron volt is about the unit for, uh, for the energy of one, uh, of one little particle or photon of light that you see. Uh, let's see, we don't get no danger for, for light. Light's not dangerous to us, almost everybody. Few people are sensitive to light. Most people just use light to see. They're out in the sun and everything. But ultraviolet light has a, uh, a significantly greater energy for its photons, little, little particles. And in fact, ultraviolet light can come in and, and hit an electron in molecules in your skin and knock that electron out of its molecule. And by doing that, it damages the molecules of skin. That's why ultraviolet radiation is dangerous, because it damages your skin. If it can knock an, an, an electron out of its molecule, that's called ionizing radiation. It can knock an electron out of its atom. That's, that's, it. that's called ionizing radiation. And all this radiation up here is ionizing radiation. Radiation that, uh, that when it strikes an atom or a molecule can eject electrons and cause damage. That's the kind that's, that can hurt us. Of course, ultraviolet can go into the skin. It usually, it doesn't go any further. It just gets absorbed in a very thin layer of skin. X-rays can go right through your whole body, can't they? And for example, remember when you broke your arm and they took an X-ray of it? it? Happens in India too, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't show where your your flesh is, your meat but it only shows the difference between bone and everything else. You see pictures of the bone. And gamma rays, which come from radiation, from radioactive materials, are even stronger, even more dangerous to you. That's why you don't want to be in the presence of radioactive material. But if you stay away from it, it's pretty safe. Uh, going the other direction, all of these types of radiation are very, uh, are, are interesting for different reasons. Uh, infrared, heat. The kind of thing you use with your television and other remotes, electronic remote controls. Microwaves, like your microwave oven. You guys use microwave ovens? Yes. That happened, didn't it? <laughs> microwave ovens and other microwaves. What's other examples of microwave communication? Really important. Right. Satellites. Satellites. All the satellite communication is done by generally in the microwave region. You go lower to get the radar. What's an important use of radar? Right. Weather radar. Shine a, 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 a large beam of ra radar and it'll reflect from clouds and rain and snow. You get a different kind of reflection and uh, therefore you can set your computers to identify various features of the weather by how the radar reflects from snow or rain or whatever. Uh, radar, and then of course there's FM and TV and AM radio. Uh, very low frequencies which aren't, aren't dangerous to us at all. We have a lot of those ra raised uh, radiations around us all the time. Well this is the way a physicist looks at, uh, at the electromagnetic spectrum. Engineers look at it a little differently. In fact, uh, there's an awful lot of telecommunication engineers in India. And we, about a third of the, uh, of the students who are in telecommunication engineering at the University of Maryland are actually Indians. 
Well, it's, gonna, it's apparently a very up and coming, very important new, uh, relatively new field. And I'd like to show you how, how engineers, electrical engineers, telecommunications engineers look at the electromagnetic spectrum. And that would be, oops, if I can find, there it is. This. A little more complicated, isn't it? In fact, I would say it's a lot more complicated. This. Let's see, where's our hand? This picture shows all of the ways in which people communicate by electromagnetic radiation from about three megahertz up here and going along the line to 30 uh, to 300 gigahertz 300 times 10 to the ninth hertz this is the entire range of electromagnetic waves that can be used for communication this happens to be the way they're allotted in the United States in North America it can be different in various locations because uh, it's th these allotments are set up by uh, by the types of communication that occur in in that area. Uh, for example, I can uh, make this bigger here. Let's do it. by doing this. Here, here is the AM radio band in in the United States. I go down here, here's, uh, here's one set of TV channels, about channels two through four here. Here's channel six through seven. Here's a FM radio. Here is channels ten, uh, eight through 11, I think. Down here is channel uh, 11 through 14. Here is 14 through 20, 21 through something else. Notice that they're not all together because they were done in a very haphazard way involving engineering. When they first did, when they did the first sets of these, they didn't even have any idea that some of these other things would ever happen. So in order to, in order to put channels of television down here, they had to kick off somebody else who was doing their radio work there. And they're now having to do that same thing in India. In fact, two days ago, I think it was, I noticed in the paper that there's a big difference, a big argument going on between the cell phone people and the Indian agency that, uh, that assigns frequencies here. Is that right? Some of you familiar with that? So it's not only happening in the United States, but also in India. And uh, what's really very important about it is that, uh, that the allocation, how these things are done, affects all of us. It affects the uh, police and fire department frequencies, it affects uh, cell phone use, it affects communication between satellites and the, and the Earth, uh, everything. Uh, let's see, I've got a couple of them here. Where is that card going? Uh, this one. Uh, here's AM radio from in, the, in the United States. I don't think you had that here. Here's FM radio in the United States. Here are a whole series of groups of channel of, of frequencies that uh, for various channels of television. Really weird. Uh, here's mobile phones frequencies. The ones that are being argued about now for India are the GSM uh, 900 and GSM 1800 frequency ranges here. Another important one to everybody, well maybe, is the global positioning system. You guys have GPS devices here? I think so. Uh, in fact, uh, the, this is the GPS device that was set up and uh, put into, I think it's 27 or 29 satellites all simultaneously going and you have to communicate with three of them to locate yourself. And the, uh, this is set up by the United States. In fact, the European Union is setting up another uh, an, a, a competing global positioning system. I don't think it's there yet, but it's, they're just under planning now. And of course, in order for them to set it up, it requires 
them to have frequency allotments that are the same, all of the standard frequencies all over the world. So this is another way in which people are going to be arguing about the spectrum. So you can use, look at the spectrum as being something like physicists. Physicists are really simple though. You know, eight or ten different classifications, and they talk about the properties of these waves. This is where it's really fun, really interesting to look at, to think about all of the uses for communication of radio waves of a huge range of frequencies. Well, I have one other kind of wave that I would like to talk to you about before uh, the end of the program. And that is, yeah, we can turn the lights on for this. This is vibrations or waves that come from your mind. Yes, brain waves. This device is called a psychoacoustic vibration transducer. It converts brain waves into vibrations of the pendulums. converts brain waves into vibrations of the pendulums. And it works, I'll tell you how, to, how we will work it. Then we can talk about, uh, more about it later. Let's see, one of you will select which of the pendulums that you want to start to move with your brain waves. And I'll stop the motion so you know there's no trick. Then what you have to do is all concentrate on that particular pendulum. When you do that, you start to communicate with each other psychically. And your brain waves start to communicate and you start to push and pull on that pendulum all together. And you actually can get enough energy to make the pendulum start to move. Okay? So let's, take it let's do it here and uh, so you can have a chance to see how this works. Here, you want to select one of the pendulums? The third one here. Okay, I'm going to stop it now. And then when I stop it, then you can all focus on this third pendulum and see if we can make it uh, make it start to move. Okay? <laughs> That's a Maybe we had to go back here. Which one do you want to do? The second one. Okay. I'll stop them here. Everybody focus on that second pendulum now. Ready? Oh, man. You guys are really good. Okay, focus. Good. Excellent. You're doing well. Yeah. So, I do this for my class in physics of sound and vibrations, and I do this for them, and I can tell they don't like it, but they don't know enough about physics to dispute me, and that's the problem, isn't it? You can believe a lot of stuff that's pretty weird and strange, but if you know enough about science, you can dispute it. Let me tell you, there is an alternative explanation for this. And I'll tell you the alternative explanation. You have seen, you have seen the psychoacoustic vibration transducer explanation for how this works. And what I'd like to do is to tell you the alternative explanation, which is for want of a better term, I'll call the driven mechanical resonator theory. Each one of these pendulums is a mechanical vibrator, isn't it? The shorter one has a, low, a higher frequency, and the longer one has a lower frequency, doesn't it? Vibrates more slowly. Now, you might think of this as sort of like a kid on a swing. If you 
you have swings in India, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Let's see. You have your friend on a swing, and if you push, the individual swings back and forth, then you push again, swings back and forth, and push again, and as long as you push at the right rate, right, at the right time, you can make the, pen, the swing swing bigger and bigger oscillations, can't you? Well, we probably can do the same thing here. Let's see. If I move the stick back and forth at the same rate that one of these pendulums swings, let's say the third one here, I can do it at a rate, at a, at a, at a very small amount so that you can't even see that I'm moving it. But the pendulum will respond because I'm moving it at the same frequency that the pendulum likes. The pendulum vibrates. That's called a mechanical resonance. If one of the others starts to swing when I'm vibrating it, pretty soon they won't be moving together. My motions, and the, or the motion of this one, say, say the two, you see, they change. And so, uh, what I'll end up doing, if one of the others starts to, to vibrate, after a while, I'll be exactly opposite, sort of like interference. I'll be exactly opposite in the motion that I'm causing compared with the motion of the pendulum, and I'll slow it down. So the only one that gets increased in amplitude, increased in the amount of motion, is the one that I'm moving at the same frequency as. Like the second one here, let's try that. I move it back and forth. The others move a little bit, but then they slow down pretty much quickly. And there it is, right? So this is the driven mechanical resonating theory of how this works. And you guys are pretty astute, I know from, uh, from coming around and seeing you a little bit before the program. So I'll let you decide whether which one of those explanations you prefer, the driven mechanical resonator theory for this device or the psychoacoustic vibration transducer theory? <laughs> Oops. Uh, all right. Actually, here's an exercise for you. You have Google. Oh, yeah, of course. If you go on Google and type psychoacoustic pendulum, or psychic pendulum. You get stuff like this and find out people actually believe it. You know, these things have have healthful, you know, healthy qualities. They'll they'll help your health. They'll help you make decisions. And when I did that, I typed psych, psychic pendulum into the Google and I got over 1800 responses, most of which were trying to sell me gold-plated ones. To, so that I could uh, be, my health would be better, and I would be able to make decisions more, uh, more effectively. So you can read about this, you can think about it, and mostly you can study science, so you'll be really well informed and be able to understand a lot of the stuff that's going on in your life about you. Ah, but before one final thing, before I quit on you. I did want to tell you about our website. Uh, perhaps the, you could uh, uh, cut the lights back just a little bit for this. Where is, where is the back? Oh, the back. I guess our web isn't working. Shucks. Huh. Well, let me just tell you about it. If you go onto our website, physics.umd.edu, they may get it fixed. Actually, back won't work because I, I did this. Um, let me try. Let me try. Thank you.
Ja, ich habe das find two things that might be of interest to you. If you go to something called services on the first page, there's a nice spectrum and uses our logo. Go to something called services and you'll find a list of all of our, of all of our demonstrations uh, divided up into, into physics topics. So all different tops of, topics of physics you can enter and look at, uh, at the demonstrations and probably there are about uh, 400 or so videos, short video clips, which show you something about how the demonstration works. A lot of neat ones. And then, for, uh, oh, looks like it's crying now. For uh, the second thing that might be of interest to you is in the area of outreach. That's the <coughs> services is the first, outreach is second. And in the outreach program, there's something called the question of the week. Physics question of the week. If you go to that, uh, there's there are archives. Go to the early ones, questions one, and so forth. And work your way up. But each question, for, uh, we've done 300 of them now. Each question involves a physics experiment or physics demonstration. We show, tell you, show you pictures of the experiment, tell you a little bit about the experiment, about the demonstration, and then ask a question. What's going to happen if we do this or that? And then we give you a range of answers. It's uh, no, no, you don't have to do any calculation. You just have to uh, think about what's going to happen. Think about the ideas of physics that are involved. And uh, then after you get done thinking about it for a while, hope some good thought, maybe argue about it with a friend. So you both can pool your knowledge and your ideas about physics. Then when you've done that, and you've come to some conclusions, maybe two of you have different conclusions, you can go to the answer, uh, the answer for each question, and the answer the question will be answered by a, a short video, usually. Right? So it'll be, again, videos of the demonstrations which are used to, to show you, to tell you what, how, how the experiment comes out. And I want to invite you all to use that. There's nothing proprietary. I'm paid by the state of Maryland, and the state of Maryland pays me to make, uh, to make educational materials. And that's what we've done, and we encourage you guys, your teachers, uh, the students, to use our educational materials and see how you like them, see whether, you can, they, whether they can help you to understand some of the ideas about physics. All right, well, I guess we're not, uh, we're not getting anywhere, so that's fine. Uh, I thank you for your attention. It's been a, very, a real joy to be with you, and good luck to you all. Thank you.